Nine seconds, the average attention span of a goldfish, a fact so widely known that it has its own saying. As of recently though, humans have overtaken the goldfish with a paltry attention span of just 8.25 seconds. Can you believe that? Well, you shouldn't, because it's not true. You may have seen some headlines mention it, but a journalist looked into the study and yeah, it's nonsense. They literally made it up. Although there is this belief that the average attention span of a person is shrinking, it's actually something that's basically impossible to quantify since it differs from one task to the next. However, that doesn't mean that it's not happening either, and when it comes to deciding what's to blame for this, the finger is usually pointed at the internet, specifically social media and content sharing platforms. This probably can't go on throughout the video, you understand. Okay, just be cool. TikTok is now the most watched video platform in the US and the UK. Created by Chinese developer ByteDance and releasing in 2018 after merging with the company's other app, Musical.ly. Remember that? TikTok has become one of the fastest growing apps ever with over 2.6 billion downloads as of 2020 and higher levels of engagement than any of its competitors. Its explosion in popularity has been staggering and because of it, numerous other companies have tried to create similar versions of it to capitalize on its success. TikTok has given birth to thousands of content creators who have amassed millions of followers in an incredibly short time span, especially when compared to creator growth on platforms like YouTube. TikTok's unique selling point though is its quick, easy to consume stream of seemingly endless video content where users can swiftly scroll through the people they follow or discover new trending content that the algorithm has decided that you may enjoy, or if you just want some idea about what everyone else is watching right now so you can be part of a broader conversation. It also has a lot of stuff on there that's honestly pretty cringe, like relationship goal videos, Hogwarts reality shifting, and whatever the hell this is. Oh yeah, you may also remember the wider good girls like bad guys, like, oof, you are grown men, stop that immediately. Although many users interact with TikTok in relatively harmless ways, like many other social media platforms, it has its problems, including the effects that it has on the minds of largely younger users, the spread of potentially dangerous misinformation regarding political issues, or harmful beauty hacks, fueling insecurities of people's bodies, especially women, the dilution of complex issues, and indeed its impact on the attention span. It's also worth discussing TikTok's far more darker aspects, such as the abundance of predators on it who interact with minors, the presence of extremists, and how it facilitates the sexualization of youths. Lastly, there's how TikTok as a platform is actually managed, from its questionable relationship with the Chinese government to how it's moderated to ensure that people who they deem as undesirable remain unseen, including those deemed poor or ugly. So it's time to unfortunately look at TikTok and its many, many problems. I hated every second of this. In the grand scheme of things, social media is still very, very new, and there's still a lot of things that we can learn about it and its effect on people. There's already been a lot of studies into various aspects, some of which I've covered in past videos, but there's a lot of uncharted territory, especially in regards to how social media platforms like TikTok will affect the growth of the minds of children. These platforms simply haven't been around long enough to ascertain what long-term exposure and interaction can do to a person, and it's made all the more difficult for researchers. The internet is evolving at such a rapid pace that it can be borderline impossible to conduct certain studies and experiments and gain valuable data in the process. Although YouTube is still incredibly popular and 
sadly has a monopoly on video content creation. As a platform, it's always been known for videos with longer run times, the magic number generally being about 10 minutes in length. Back in 2013 though, the app Vine was released and it turned out there was a huge market for shorter video content. With their unique selling point, so to speak, was that their maximum length for their videos on their platform were a measly 6 seconds. At first it was really popular, but after competitors like Instagram started releasing similar services with less restrictive runtimes, advertisers and content creators began to migrate to them to maximize exposure and profits, which led to previous Vine stars such as Logan Paul and Jake Paul, Lele Pons, Gabby Hanna and way more to move to other platforms where they were able to grow even more. So yeah, thanks for giving us them Vine. It's a good job that nothing bad ever came from them, right? Uh oh. If there was anything learned from this, it's that younger demographics love consuming content from their phone and they consume a ton of it, often without much thought put into it, since unlike with a platform like YouTube, you don't have to think about investing your time into a longer video. Much like TikTok, you just open up the app, let it play and then move on to the next video in a matter of seconds with some ads in between. And it's those ads that make an idea like this so lucrative. They can be shown to the viewer far more frequently than on a platform like YouTube where they have to remain engaged throughout the video if they're to see multiple ads. Even then, they're depending on the video creator actually putting ads in their videos and choosing when they play, kind of like this. You could win lifetime passes to Coachella. Okay, I'm messing with you. I, I couldn't help myself. The short form video has now become so popular that other platforms have started to create their own versions of it. Instagram have had their own video service for a good while now. Facebook has stories. Twitter created fleets, which lasted less than a year before being shut down. And right here on YouTube, they have YouTube Shorts, which I keep getting emails saying that I should try it out. But considering I find it impossible to keep a video under 20 minutes in length, it ain't gonna happen. Oh, and of course a Snapchat, but no one cares about Snapchat. All in all, there's an overwhelming amount of content to consume online to occupy every single second of your day. Whether you want to go out of your way to watch something or have an algorithm decide for you. On YouTube alone, over 500 hours of video are uploaded every single minute throughout the day. Whilst that can be a nice thing if you're someone like me who doesn't like to sit in silence while working or existing, but endless amount of content comes with its problems. Now before I get into this, I don't want you to think of this whole thing as phone bad or a call to get back to the good old days where we weren't connected every second of the day. Just like anyone, I'm guilty of whipping out my phone whenever I'm in bed, in a waiting room, driving on a highway at full speed, or spending quality time with my family. One of those was a joke, by the way. We're all guilty of it. In fact, in a survey conducted by Statista back in February 2021, they found that 46% of respondents claimed that they spend around 5 to 6 hours every day on their phone. Given that this was during the pandemic, the numbers may be a little bit higher than usual, but regardless, phone use has been trending upwards for the past few years now. Although there is no conclusive evidence on whether the internet and social media has done anything to affect the attention span of people, there is other similar and relevant evidence, like in a 2018 study where children aged 15 to 16 who didn't present any ADHD symptoms prior were observed for the development of symptoms after a 24-month period of heavy to no digital media use. They found that those who use digital media the most, especially social media, had developed some form of ADHD symptoms. By comparison, the number of children who didn't engage in any social media activity were over 50% less than the group who used it the most. Of course, this doesn't prove causation, just an association. But data like this is enough to warrant further studies, especially when the sample used in this instance had socio-demographic diversity, something which many prior studies had lacked. With people spending so much time on their devices and taking in so much information throughout the day, one of the biggest concerns is the kind of information that they are actually taking in. 
And this can be especially problematic when it comes to young minds or even those who are more impressionable to what they consume online. With so much information and people's opinions being spread around online by billions of people and various institutions, it's become practically impossible to moderate all of it, at least with enough expediency that it can mitigate harm before it spreads. Alongside that, there's also the presence of content which can encourage dangerous and possibly fatal injuries being presented in various forms from pranks to challenges. This has become a huge problem with every social media platform and given a much younger audiences on TikTok, the possibility of long-term damage on their mind and even bodies is concerning. That isn't to say that all kids and teens are too dumb to recognize when something is wrong and harmful, but ultimately younger minds are more impressionable and quicker to internalize information. Take for example the many challenge trends that appear on TikTok, of which there are many of them. Physical challenges in particular have often been incredibly dangerous. Take for example the milk crate challenge, in which people would attempt to climb up a stack of milk crates with little or nothing for protection, which resulted in numerous people being injured and possibly crowding already packed hospitals for a stupid stunt. There's also the nutmeg challenge, in which people ingest large amounts of the ingredient, which has been known to have adverse health effects and on some cases been fatal. Oh, and don't forget the penny challenge, where people would try to slide a coin on the prongs of a phone charger that's partially inserted into a live outlet. How are these people still alive? Like, you, you know that's dangerous. Even outside of the dangerous ones, there are challenges that are just awful, like the devious licks challenge where students would allegedly steal expensive items from their already underfunded school. Obviously, most level-headed people can look at these and realize that they are dangerous or dumb, but still lots of people participate in these challenges. They get millions of views and likes and they inspire people to keep making newer and sometimes more dangerous challenges to surpass the last trend. As for the spread of misinformation, there's no shortage of that on TikTok, and amongst the most popular ones are beauty hacks. Some stupid, some dangerous, some both, such as putting boner cream on your lips just to make them look more plump, using lube as a makeup primer, sunscreen contouring, full facial waxing, homemade freckle tattoos, and possibly worst of all, tooth filing to achieve a straighter smile, which I'm not going to show you because it made my skin crawl. Like I said, I know that not everyone is so impressionable that they'll watch these things and believe they work or don't understand they're potentially mutilating themselves, but some people do. And when you're a young person who feels insecure about their body, some people will go to great lengths to achieve beauty especially if it's cheap and supposedly simple. It also doesn't help that TikTok, along with many other social media platforms, essentially heighten people's insecurities, with the presence and celebration of people who are famous for being conventionally attractive. TikTok has even been complicit in ensuring that beautiful and or rich people are seen the most on the app. In March 2020, The Intercept published leaked Chinese language documents for TikTok's moderators and translated it in English for global officers, often in pretty clumsy ways. Among these rules, the company required the moderators to ensure that content containing people that they deem ugly, unattractive, or even those with congenital traits remain buried and become far less likely to trend and be seen by new users. To quote from their guidelines, this includes abnormal body shape, people who are chubby, obvious beer bellies, obese people, and people who are too thin. They also avoid promoting people that they consider to have ugly facial looks, facial deformities, and they don't want users to see those that might be considered poor. So that means excluding videos of those who live in slums, dilapidated housing, or even if you have cracks on your wall. The idea is to create an experience for new users so the content they see is aspirational, promoting a sense of wealth and beauty, with writers of the rules saying this kind of environment is not suitable for new users for being less fancy and appealing. And FYI, if any of these quotes sound a bit odd, it's because I preserve the original translation, but I assume you got that point. 
Social media already has innumerable issues when it comes to self-image, whether that's their own body image or just how their life is perceived in general. Of course, many of us are aware of the way that people project themselves on social media and how it's an often heavily orchestrated and curated portrayal of an ideal, carefree and fun life, especially when it comes to influencers whose very existence is predicated around the idea of aspirational living, sort of like HGTV for millennials and Gen Z. For a lot of people though, below the surface there is often turmoil that isn't shared publicly or even acknowledged. Researchers at Stanford University even coined a term for this called duck syndrome, because to an observer, ducks look like they're gliding effortlessly across the pond, but unseen to us, the duck is frantically paddling its legs trying to stay afloat and swim. Many people don't realize that this struggle exists though, and just see the duck gliding along majestically and wonder why they're not capable of doing the same. They see beautiful people living glamorous lives, and regardless whether these portrayals are a manicured snapshot of a person's life, beauty is a currency which people are born with, and some people will never have any for themselves, but spend a lifetime pining for it, left to feel insecure or resort to drastic measures for a shred of privilege. In a society in which anxiety and depression have been on a consistent rise, the consumption of content like this doesn't help young developing minds who on some level know that social media isn't making them happy, and when apps like TikTok go out of their way to ensure that its users see this aspirational content, it's hard to justify those actions. When the Child Mind Institute spoke to some teenagers about their experiences with social media, a 15-year-old girl named Sasha said the following. I knew a girl who had an eating disorder. We all knew it. It got so bad that she ended up going to a treatment center, but when she put up pictures of herself on the beach looking super thin, everyone liked them anyway. Evidently, the effect of these posts on the viewer isn't the only problem. TikTok and its counterparts are fueled by engagement such as likes, and when someone posts content that could be dangerous or promote unrealistic standards of image and wealth, not only is the user being validated, but the poster is too, which is especially problematic when it comes to endorsements of body modifications or even eating disorders. It's a cruel feedback loop in which the poster can be rewarded for their harmful actions and the viewer is invalidated for their failure to live up to the standards that have been set by them. Welcome aboard the Boost Bus, where I take a moment in each video to promote the work of other creators who I believe don't get anywhere near the amount of recognition that they deserve, whether that's artists, musicians, video makers, or anything else. This time I'd like to share with you the work of Anna Marta, a Peruvian designer and illustrator who resides in New York City. Anna currently works as a designer at a tech company. Her stylistic influences range from cute pastel-filled pieces like the ones that you see here, to cosmic horror with inspiration taken from Junji Ito, H.R. Geiger, and David Lynch. Yes, I'm counting David Lynch as cosmic horror. Go watch a razor head and try to tell me otherwise. She also cites the work of Kentaro Muira, the creator of the Berserk manga, among her many influences. As you can see from her pieces, along with the pristine use of line work, colors both pastel and monochrome, her composition and attention to detail all create a distinct aesthetic that's uniquely Anna's throughout each style, with lots of wonderfully expressive character details built in. Anna is currently accepting commissions, so if you would like to help her out and get some amazing artwork in return, then follow her on her socials. You can also visit her website to look over her amazing portfolio. All the links are posted in the description. If you're a creator who would also like a ride on the Boost Bus, then please feel free to apply by sending an email to solarivideo at gmail.com. Be sure to include your pronouns, a short bio about yourself and your work, and links to socials or other relevant sites. Also, if you do work as an artist or a similar creative field, please be sure to include high quality samples of your work to be used in the video. I won't be able to reply to your emails, but rest assured, they are all being read. Anyway, I need to stop the bus. There is a kid carving a pentagram into the back seat, and I'm worried they're going to summon Satan. Again. 
Outside of its posts based around individuals and their effect on self-image and worth, TikTok has a variety of content that has a more substantial purpose behind it, such as accounts with the aim of educating users on real-world issues and mental health awareness. The latter has been useful when it comes to people learning about mental illness, understanding and comparing their experiences to others, or even feeling less alone by hearing about the struggles and coping mechanisms of people who share their illness. In general, this is a good thing. Mental health awareness is a net positive, especially among people who would benefit from early treatment and learning coping mechanisms. There are many actual mental health professionals on TikTok who share their expertise, knowledge, and even personal experiences with their viewers offering a proper, medically sound representation which may help users better understand themselves. Dr. Kojo Safro, a mental health nurse practitioner and psychotherapist, has a following over 2.3 million on TikTok, where he shares representations of a variety of mental illnesses through skits based around relatable everyday scenarios and how people with those disorders may better cope with them. On the other side of that coin though, there are people who spread misinformation about mental illness, non-professionals masquerading as people with expertise and wisdom, or in some cases simply copying and cannibalizing the content of actual professionals. There are also people who undermine the importance of receiving treatment and make claims that illnesses can be treated by doing simple tasks and that medications aren't necessary. In a country like America, where mental health care comes at a premium, it can be a relief for people who can't afford it to hear that there is an easy solution to their issues, and they may feel better, at least temporarily, but it's a placebo. Any and all medical advice found online should always be double-checked by a professional, even when said advice is given by a professional. And although mental health awareness has given many people on TikTok some comfort, the waters are still very murky when people are unable to check the credentials of those giving it out. TikTok's educational content also has a similar issue, where much of it can be from dubious sources just like any other social media platform. But the nature of the short form video becomes an issue where major issues and events are distilled to such a level that it's hard to comprehend the magnitude of them. Something like the Israel-Palestine conflict simply cannot be encapsulated in a runtime that's less than a minute or so. So while awareness is raised, the nuance is removed from it, leaving people to discover the rest for themselves. There's another problem with this though, and that's actually encouraging follow-up research in the individual. But TikTok is ultimately about distraction, so although an important issue may be in your mind at one moment, it's only a matter of seconds until your attention is directed in a completely different direction, leading the user to possibly store that information in the back of their minds, never to act on it. This is just the nature of trending topics on TikTok and other platforms though. It's not about engaging with just one topic, it's about engaging then moving on to the next one. Never really giving enough time to anything to make an impact, thinking that sharing or liking a post is tantamount to actually taking meaningful action to make a change. Social media platforms profit from hoarding your attention and have found that should your attention remain on one thing for far too long, people get fatigued and decide to go elsewhere for content. Much of the content that we consume is driven by rage clicks and there's always something to be angry about. Then there are just completely tone-deaf attempts at raising awareness. Like with this trend where the worst kids at drama school attempted to raise awareness of the horrors of the Holocaust by cosplaying its victims while showing off their absolutely abysmal acting skills. Where are their parents, seriously? Awareness is good, but action is better. Just look at the Black Lives Matter protests that happened across the world in 2020. As events go, that was around for a substantial amount of time, and it was impossible to avoid when scrolling through social media. People got passionate about it, and rightfully so, but when posts started drying up and people started turning off their cameras, the protests were still happening, but people were given less of a reason to care. 
Some change came from it, albeit in very minor ways, but it didn't feel like it was enough, at least not relative to the amount of people who demanded it. The police are still the police, justice belongs to those who can afford it, and although many of us are still desperate for change, it's hard to achieve when there aren't enough voices demanding change. Look, I am not saying that TikTok is inherently evil or anything like that, but the fact is it has its problems, much like every other social media platform. I also don't want you to think that this is some sort of moral panic where I'm saying, won't somebody please think of the children? But it is a platform that largely is populated by young people, with almost half of its users being aged 10 to 29. And young people, especially children and teens, are impressionable. Given the negative impact that social media can have on people's psyche and their world view, it's worth questioning whether its pros outweigh its cons. Also, a little uh, interesting tidbit for you here. While I was in the middle of writing this script, I got an email for a potential sponsorship with a Chinese video platform called Zhigua Video, which I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong asking if I would like to have my content hosted on there uh, with translations, revenue for views, all of that kind of stuff. It was a legit offer to not like the dozens of dodgy fake sponsors that I get all the time. However, it turns out that Zhigua Video is owned by ByteDance, the same company that owns TikTok. Sometimes the stars just align at the most perfect time. Also, just to be clear, I, I would have said no, even if I wasn't doing this video, because no way in hell. As I said at the beginning, there's not really any way of knowing right now what kind of impact social media will have on the minds of people who grow up with it, and how it will affect them in adulthood, because it hasn't existed long enough for us to find out. But it's safe to assume that when that data is made available, it will more than likely be profound, and hopefully encourage change, or at least regulation. Tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, and ByteDance are ultimately profit-driven and don't have any real stake in the well-being of their users. They like to claim that they do, but in the case of TikTok, I think it's fairly evident when you look at their guidelines that they don't. And even when they do take action to remove content from their platform that's dangerous or contains misinformation or even hate speech, it's generally only done when these trends start getting media attention. All this is without even going into the fact that the Chinese government has a disturbing amount of oversight over TikTok, going as far as to censor or remove posts that are critical of their government, along with the fact that the app takes an absurd amount of personal data from you, including your biometrics and it's not fully clear on how they use all of that stuff. I'm sure some people would respond to that with, oh, well, US tech companies take information from you all the time, isn't that a problem? Yes. Yes, it is. Thankfully, there is still a desire for substance though. Even when presented in a digestible form like a video, there's plenty of well-researched and informative long-form videos that perform incredibly well on places like YouTube that promote discussions, raise awareness, and encourage action that are well-produced by people who take a lot of time to make them, and it's a shame that some people put them on in the background since the creators put so much time and effort into editing them yeah, I'm talking to you right now. You know who you are. Stop your cleaning or close Instagram on your phone and watch the video. I had to watch a lot of dumb TikTok videos for this, so the least you could do is look at the screen. This ain't a podcast. I ain't Joe Rogan. I'm just messing. Do, do what you need to do, but it's fine. I don't think we could possibly convince platforms like TikTok to stay focused on the things that matter and I don't think it's necessarily productive to keep our attention glued to everything wrong with the world. It's a pretty bleak place at times, and people need distractions. I know I do. I'd probably lose the will to live if I remained fixated on all the bad things happening at every given moment. I do think it's important, however, that we keep talking about the things that matter, though. To put effort into learning more, being passionate enough about things so that people care to take action and enact change. 
It's difficult to do this on an individual scale, and tools like social media can be useful in spreading these messages. But while algorithms created by profit-driven corporations control the narrative and refuse to let people keep their attention focused on the things that matter, too many voices become drowned out in the void of content, never allowed to echo or become loud enough to be heard. Thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, then please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, all of that stuff. It really does help out. If you'd also like to support the channel even further, you can do so at patreon.com slash Solari. All of the people you see scrolling up here right now all contribute a bit each month to help keep funding future projects and keeping the channel alive. It does go a very long way and I really appreciate it. I'd also like to offer a special shout out to all of the people that donate $5 or more each month. And that goes out to King Me, Christian Moyer, or Moye, Catherine Pendel, in a Borat voice, my wife, Praise Lord Gilgamesh, Nicholas McDonnell, Azil Crescent, Alicia Crawford, Rachel J. Stark, Maurice Robert, Candide, Dan McCrary, Remy Allen, Daniel Perone, Anna Marie Hanyasova, Freeman Killer, Lizzie Peasy, Grant B, Jay, Jordan Christoph, Matthew Torres, Rach, Enrique Gutierrez, Murgurger Fashionabler, Alina, Ratams, Games, Martina, Sanderpanda, CB Hart, Kevin Corber, Lillian Roan, Sharfay, Nostricon, Mickey Bonadonna, Sparrow Wagon, Marius Stubberud, Catherine, and Steve Ma. Thank you all so very much for your support. It really does mean the world to me. And like I said, it keeps things going around here. So thank you so much. And like I said, if you would like to join them in supporting us, then you can do so at patreon.com slash Solari. The link's in the description. And also, if you would like to join our Discord server, you can do so at discord.gg slash Solari also in the description if you want to join there. Lots of nice people there that you can talk to uh, and I show up every now and then. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and I will see you next time, okay? Bye-bye.